So uh, we're moving into our presentation for the night. It's going to be with Steve Anderson up front. He's going to wave his hand. You're going to see lots of him today. He's going to talk about full spectrum civic engagement. But what he's really going to do is blow your mind. And here's why he's going to blow your mind. Because this is a guy who came and like founded Open Media, who then went on within a year to create the largest mailing list of any nonprofit in Canada. Let me tell you, I was at the David Suzuki Foundation at the time. We've been working on that thing for 25 years. And then some jerks show up out of nowhere <laughs> who don't have Canada's panda bear and made a bigger mailing list. <laughs> and let me tell you, I wasn't cheerleading for him. I was just a little bit miffed about who is this jerk, where did he come from, how did he do that? So he's going to talk a little bit about how he actually really engages community and builds these really full-functioning campaigns. He's got a new sexy project going on right now, which is called New Mode. And so what he's done is he's taken all the best practices and all the tools that they built out through open media over the years, and he basically said, I could be a massive hog and just like not share this stuff, but why don't I go and actually take these, turn them into more generalized products, and open that up to the sector. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the work he's done there as well, um, but I don't need to pretend I know all the great things about Steve, because he's going to tell you all the great things about Steve. So I'm going to get out of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. H. Steve Anderson. Woo! Uh, give it up for Eli. <laughs> okay, good. I didn't break it. I usually break it at this point. All right, Steve, it's all you. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks again, Eli, and all the nice to be able to share the space with you. Um, I'll talk a little bit um, about me. And so, um, as Eli said, I found Open Media, we're a civic affordable and surveillance free. How many people have heard of Open Media? Um, so it's kind of like, the, I like to say, like three Ps stuff for the internet. Um, and as Eli was mentioning, so now I'm trying to share what we learned through new mode, purpose-driven, um, sharing these kind of civic engagement with other nonprofits. And so really I'm trying to spend my time just sharing what I've learned and trying to help organizations um, who are trying to make the world a better place. And why I'm here today and just generally what I'm trying to do with my with my time. And you know, I think often speakers on digital engagement, like they just magically have all the answers. Uh, but really anything that I'm saying today is learned through like some research, but mostly through trial and error. Um, and there's been some error. I I, I want to start this by noting that mistakes are that they're gonna be a thing. Anyone who's done campaigns work knows that it's something not to be afraid of. That internet to run for center is a, a real, actual headline of a press release of Open Media for real since 2011. Um, um, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute, but I want to just back up for a second and, and give that like a little, a little bit of context. So, um, in 2011, we kind of had a we we're a really small organization, mostly volunteer driven, and we had this kind of giant campaign that exploded called Stop the Meter, which was all about stopping um, uh, telling companies from putting a pay meter on your expensive. And I think when we started that campaign, actually, Eli was kind of volunteering and helping us with the time. I actually remember you leaving our tiny little office, it was all volunteers, and right before you walked out the door, you said, Your problems are insurmountable. Close the door and walk <laughs> but, um, uh, but anyways, like <laughs> a couple a couple months later, we had, so we had this mailing list with maybe like nine. That was like our community, um, tiny little budget, no real office, um, and we just kind of hit this at the right moment, at the right time, and kind of we're, we're lucky in some ways and. Some of our previous learning just kind of came to fruition, and within a few months, we had half a million people. Uh, and 
Um, so I think it's one of the largest campaigns in history now. And so you can imagine um, volunteers, myself, um, others, like Lizzie, uh, uh, was at, there at the time, Riley Yo as well, and, and kind of just like national media coming through, um, our website breaking, 20,000 people uh, doing action. It was just quite frankly like extremely frightening. I was like, what's this stuff? But um, um, it's basically the thoughts in my head. And if you fast forward to the election that was coming up in May of that, that year, basically we had spent four months just in this kind of grueling campaign trying to build the kind of plane while it was in the air, trying to build the organization at the same time, um, going to CRTC hearings, trying to keep this community engaged. Um, and uh, when by the time the election came up, we had sort of won the election, um, and and we were just like so tired of working on this particular issue. And we're like, we want to do something fun. Um, everyone likes fun things, and so we decided to run the internet. Um, we thought it was a great idea. Um, so we created this character. Um, we emailed half a million people about him. Um, we had videos, we had uh, swag that I still have, um, and I'll, I'll just, there's a reason why I'm showing this, but I'll just um, show you a video just so you can really get a picture of this. I'm the internet, and I approve this message. What if, what if there was hope, not fear, unity, instead of division? What if we had a Prime Minister with a vision for a connected future? This is not about the West Coast or the East Coast. This is about one connected Canada. The Internet has helped connect over 30 million Canadians. It's changed the way we communicate, share information, and collaborate. It is a leader with a positive vision for Canada. This election is about the future. The future of the internet. The future of Canada. <laughs> uh, I'll, t I'll talk more about this in a sec, but it didn't go that well. Um, and, I'll, and like, some, some people didn't like it. Some people loved it, and like we had like a, a small group, very small group of people liked it. Someone made this. The net. Volunteer made this. It, it wants, wants to be Prime, Prime Minister of Canada, <laughs> but can we really trust it? In, In Ottawa, it's, it's voted 100% of, of the time to lower your internet prices and, and increase choice. choice. This reckless behavior would have a devastating impact on Canada's telecom oligopoly. It wants to reform the CRTC to have a stronger public interest mandate, but is this really in your best interest? It's not even really Canadian. It's been to France, and Iran, and has questionable relations with China. Can we really trust the net with Canada's digital future? We didn't think so. Paid for by the Consortium of Powerful Vested Interests Against Canada's Digital Future. Okay, I, I, I have just one more because I find it funny. So, so we, we actually, like, there's so many things that we did. Um, but we actually, like, created this character so you could see through it, through this, um, uh, like, giant screen. Um, and it's just, I have to show it to you. It's just, like, a really... Sorry. No, I have to say, it's a little legal to do this, to run a campaign on the internet when you, you are the internet. Okay. Well, you know, if, um, if I stand up for myself, I don't know who would, quite frankly. Um, you know, James, uh, have you seen that? So I can't believe I apologized for that, first of all. Um, I think that was when they were just getting started. Um, and, like, when we were leading up to this, Jack Layton agreed to debate next. <laughs> 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 what if, yeah, I had that email. Uh, uh, <laughs> and the, so, I mean, we thought it was super awesome ourselves, um, but our, our community was just, we do not like this. Because you have to remember, like, so many of the people who took part in this campaign, this was like the first political act. Um, and so, that, 
So to them, it was like we were making a joke for the first time that they had actually been acting. Um, and so that was the way that they, they felt about it. And I, I highlight that because um, I'm going to highlight that because um, it was really important. And like everything that we've done since, and, and I've learned some things, um, it's just because we learned this lesson that like we're not the audience. Um, and we just did some really hard thinking. Okay, like what do we, how do we design our campaigns and our work to really and to grow the power of the community? Um, and so, you know, it, it was a hard lesson to learn, but it was really important. I think like these types of like experimentation and monitoring what you're learning is really like more important than I'll say today. So, um, and also seriously, I do have like. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna go over um, some core components of what we're calling full spectrum uh, engagement, which is a form of engagement that I think is really powerful. Now elsewhere, um, and I'll go through you know some different principles, um, and then I'll show some case studies. So don't worry if it's um, I'm going to download a lot of stuff, but um, I'll actually like, show it in action. It open media and run. So I'm going to talk about engagement principles, about um, how scale engagement campaigns are network, it's multi channel, and how their relationship with. So, engagement principles. Um, so, the first key principle. Uh, and this came from from that taught us a lot of lessons, but it came came from uh, uh, just other kind of campaign iterations we've run it over. But um, so one is um, show malleability. So I mean, people in our society generally like to don't think that they can be I mean, apathy and cynicism. Uh, it's like the first villain. Um, and so showing. Um, that society is malleable and that people can make change as clearly as possible um, is really important. And just in your communications, your storytelling, um, it's really important to make that clear. Um, and to kind of show a roadmap. Think about if you got um, IKEA furniture and you weren't given um, a roadmap or a, you know, uh, instructions for how to make that. Think of your campaigns and your communications that way. Explain kind of how the action will lead to an outcome, and that society is malleable, and just reinforce that with people because they're told the opposite every day in um, and other communications that they can't do anything, um, have an identity, and have an expression by buying things. And we have to um, beat that back. Um, the other, the second um, really key principle is give um, give recognition. So as much as possible, and kind of they all fit together. Show that um, recognize the efforts that people take and how they lead to uh, an, an outcome. Um, so, for example, even little things like if your campaign gets media, um, celebrate that with your community and, and note that your community and, and the people you're engaging are the protagonists in your community and that they have had this this outcome. Um, so, recognize all the efforts as much as possible. Like at Open Media, sometimes we'll. Um, we'll name people like this person wrote this letter to the editor showing up, and so we're just recognizing that. Um, the third thing is be accessible. So the you know the key thing is remembering that we're not the audience. Like if you're engaging people online, um, if you're especially if you're trying to do mass engagement, um, they're probably not working on digital rights or the environment issue every day like you are. Um, and so just try to be um, as accessible as possible and meet people where they're at. So I'll show this um, in some of the case studies, but um, give people um, a really easy actions they can take, really simple, um, but also if people are very highly engaged, then provide them that avenue as well, let them volunteer, communicate with them uh, that way. The fourth one is um, build relationships, not data and mailing lists. Um, um, they're obviously kind of the same thing, but um, what I mean there is, you know, like look at your kind of communication, your supporters or your community or your members, 
as building a relationship um, over over time, rather than you're just trying to like build a mailing list or get more data. Um, and so look at it as like a dialogue. Um, and then the last one is is share ownership. So if you have an ability to um, share ownership of a campaign with your supporters or with coalition or network, the more you do that, the more you'll get out of the relationship. So at times, um, Open Media has put out a campaign, um, and our supporters on Facebook or on social media channels or an email have have said like, "Hey, this messaging is insensitive," or like, "I don't really understand this," um, and we take that input and kind of say like, "Well, it's your campaign, and uh, you're making a valid point. Um, we're going to change that. We're going to adapt it about um, sharing ownership." And the same with network. How can you invite? Uh, in, into a project, and I mean, with these things, you can do it in sophisticated ways, but you can also, um, if you have a large community or if you have staff, but um, there's also simple ways to do it. Like when we were starting at Open Media, um, my testing audience was my mother. Like I was like, I would call my mom and say, "Mom, look at this page and this email. Does this make sense?" Um, she'd be like, "I don't get this like word." And I'm like, All right, change it. And so. Just, you can start anywhere with this, you can start with an audience, um, but just try to try to test um, all these things. So the second main kind of way to do um, full spectrum engagement is to be as network as you can. So this is with, so rather than kind of being kind of top down on operating on your own as an organization, or person, um, or um, kind of traditional coalitions where there's committees and everything. Um, as much as you can, try to run campaigns, engagement campaigns as a network of organizations. Um, and so you want that to be dynamic and kind of loosely coordinated by dynamic people. Um, you want that to be decentralized, so you want there to be an autonomous engagement, and you want um, you want it to basically be bound within a very simple uh, statement of unity. So one example is tomorrow, you'll see this in the news tomorrow, there's going to be a large day of action for the open internet in the U.S. that open media and other are um, And what binds them is saying, we believe in the open internet. So it's really easy for a huge number of organizations to be involved in that. And this is going to be probably one of the biggest Online campaigns in the history of the world, and that would only be possible if they had made it um, very inclusive and easy to take. Um, and, then, uh, and then, yeah, so the last one, the third one is inclusive. So let anyone join the project state and community. So don't kind of say, like, only these types of organizations um, welcome people and organizations in. The last one is um, you want to be amplifying. So members are encouraged. Others material. So, um, for example, the day of action tomorrow, open media will have a bunch of share images and a bunch of blog content. We'll invite other members of the network to share that. Um, Amazon and Netflix will have stuff, which I'm sure we'll share. Um, and so it's about kind of not controlling what everyone's doing, but just amplifying the work that people are doing um, with a common alignment. So I'll skip over this, but if you want to dig in more about like network campaigning, um, there's a group called NetChange. Uh, Jason Mogus and Lucas um, work there, and they have a report that's just about that. And they go into more detail about how you can run network campaigns um, and the kind of benefits and the kind of structures that you want to have. And I highly recommend it if you're trying to do mass engagement. So the third main element is being multi-channel. Um, so you want to make it so your campaign is impossible to And so if someone puts up a petition or has a letter writing campaign, and let's say even a lot of people do it, but then uh, it, it, it dies down after a week or two, if you're a decision maker, you're going to say like, well, you know, it's like there's a community here that cares, but like the cost benefit has basically gone away and I can ignore this. Um, but as I'll show, if you 
um, have multi-channel going and you kind of do it over time, step by step, um, then they're seeing you. If you think about it from their perspective, um, think of them kind of as the audience. They're seeing an email and then seeing thousands of people email them. A week later, they're getting uh, tweets um, from people seeing that public kind of shaming them or encouraging them to do this. Um, and maybe they're getting a fax. Maybe they're getting uh, phone calls. Um, so that's another element of kind of this full spectrum. And the last element is the being um, So this is a pyramid of engagement. Many are going to use this. There's other models as well. But the idea is that you're building and deepening relationships with people um, in your engagement. And so the idea is kind of like, you know, if I just if I just met you, uh, I probably asked you if you wanted to go out for a cup of coffee. I wouldn't say, "Hey, can you drive me to the airport?" You'd be like, "What? No, I'm not into that. <laughs> Get yourself to the airport." Um, so it's a similar idea with this um, pyramid of engagement, where you um, start low, make do a low barrier action. So ask someone like, "Will you put up your hands to the petition and say I I support um, X Y policy?" And then over time, try and try and deepen that relationship. So writing letters to the editor, which is what I do actually, I sit down and think, um, and and use your your voice and put yourself in. All the way up to being a person volunteer or doing phone banking. So I'm going to do a case study now. Um, so the TPP, the Trans Pacific Partnership. I like funny books and things. Um, can does anyone out there want to describe the Trans Pacific Partnership? Who wants to try? Anyone? All right, I'll do it. Um, so the trans civic Partnership is a multilateral uh, trade agreement, um, including uh, or, organize, or, sorry, countries in the Pacific region, Canada, uh, Japan, Chile, um, and the US, others. Um, and basically, it's a trade agreement that um, would include things like copyright um, rules that would censor the internet, um, quite simply. Um, but it would also include things like investor state policies, which would make it so that um, Canada could be sued if we made rules that hurt a corporation's profit. Um, it would undermine our healthcare, our public healthcare system, because that undermines the security. Um, and so there's a range of other issues, but basically whether you care about the environment, digital rights, um, access to medicine, uh, democracy, um, the TPP is seen as an anti-democratic, a, a bad deal. Um, and so open media um, took on a campaign to kind of educate and engage people on this issue at an international level. And so I'll just talk about some of how we, how we did that. Um, so this is the pyramid of engagement, um, uh, but showing the kind of engagement pieces that we did with the campaign. Um, so you can see like observing is kind of like emails, website traffic, um, endorsing is people who would sign a petition, um, contributing and kind of sharing on social media, so kind of like identifying themselves as part of this. Um, uh, leading is kind of letters to the editor, crowdsourcing, Owning and volunteering, and so the idea with this campaign was: how do we get a big, deeply engaged um, community of people who will um, stand up against this, this um, problematic um, international trade agreement? Because what we know is when a large group of deeply engaged people speak out on mass over time, um, they can actually stop things, change things, and um, make policies that. And so the first step, the bottom of that pyramid, um, is um, you, you have low barrier, simple, um, which is basically saying, 
hey, if you think if you have concerns about this, like we do, put up your hand and let the system handle it. Um, very easy to do, very um, on purpose. Now, when we did that, we want to um, make sure that voices are getting to decision makers. Um, but we also, more importantly, to the principles of engagement, we want to recognize that. So, hey, when you sign that thing, when you sign that thing, um, when you send that letter, it goes somewhere, it does. Um, and so this is us um, delivering uh, the petitions to the chief negotiator the United States and the TPP. Um, so you can imagine if you're someone, we would email people who signed up to send, send them this photo and, and basically say, oh, okay, like when I when I act together with a bunch of people through Open Media or through another organization, I can actually like have an impact. Um, there's an important message actually right now. Um, so the other thing we did is, um, I'll show in a minute, this was like a big kind of shared um, and we kind of put together all of our energy and had good three million people get involved. And it's one of the um, and another way that we deliver voices, um, recognize people's efforts, um, was we projected um, petition count in Washington D.C. on buildings around Washington D.C. Um, while Obama uh, was having TV. Again, deliver the voice, show that people um, can be heard, and, and also like deliver that voice to decision makers. Like, hey, we're watching, and there's a lot of us. So back to talking about networks. So there's no way that um, open media can marshal that number of people and go with people. Um, and so this is where kind of building networks. So, these are a bunch of words, snapshot. These are a bunch of that we collaborated with um, on the TPP. Um, um, and so basically, like they all just signed on saying, We have concerns with this. We didn't ask for anything else on what this specific issue was. They, we just said, Hey, if you want to work on engaging people around the TPP, then join us. And so some people would talk about democracy and talk about the environment. Um, Daily Coast would be one of those, we come at it that way, um, and they have a really large community of people. Others like Fight for the Future are digital rights organizations, um, and they're based in the U.S. where we have a limited reach and extend the, the movement that way to become like the leaders uh, in that type of thing. Others like Imager is like a website, so they just sent a bunch of people. They had put up free ads. Um, people like Demand Progress are at lobbying and doing policy. So the kind of when you bring the, these pieces together, it's much more powerful the campaign. Um, and, uh, and it just empowers all of us and builds that broader movement. So the second one of the second things that we did was uh, um, asking people to email their MP or to email uh, I think at some point we had on the trade ministers or some comments into, uh, into the TPP process. Um, and so this, it's, it's a little bit deeper engagement. So it's asking people to be a bit more um, engaged in our campaign. Um, so we're saying, take the next step, send this letter. And so basically, this is them kind of, there's a second step and it's their information. And there was a letter that would come in. Um, they could edit that, or they could just send the letter. but. It, or just a bit more thought and a bit more dedication than just putting up your hand and saying, I don't like it. Um, so it was getting people to take that next step, and it was also having thousands of people actually send a message that goes to members of parliament or goes to the minister or the negotiator. Um, so it, it's creating a new channel of communication that way. And so again, kind of trying to recognize people's efforts and deliver voices and actually show them um, that their voice matters. Um, we projected their letters and comments uh, inside the meeting room of a TPP negotiating room. So um, when negotiators would come out, they would see a stream of citizen comments. Um, and I think that's the negotiator. Um, so again, kind of delivering voices right to the TPP. 
people who, who can make choices. And you can imagine if you're a person taking action in this campaign, you're like, whoa, cool. <laughs> they're actually like, reading their comments. Um, and the, the TPP made a mistake of letting me do a presentation <laughs> before the negotiators and the audience. Um, uh, this is before they shut it down. I hope it wasn't just for me. Um, but they completely made the process secretive after this round. Um, um, and so what, what we did was we asked people to send in comments, and we said that we would deliver it to decision makers at this point. Um, and so while I was speaking, um, we had a live stream of, of citizen comments on this iPad, and I just handed it to negotiate. Just sit with this and read and see what people are saying about the kind of decision. Um, and we reported back and, and kind of brought people into the process, showed that the system is not able to show that we can make change, recognize. So the next thing we did was we asked people to uh, send a letter to um, using the, this tool. Um, so you just write your letter and it goes to all those um, publications. So you can, you can see here several publications, and again, like people, like I myself, like have used this tool and it got published in the province. I'm like, cool, awesome. Like, um, so it's, it's a really cool thing for people to see. And so after they got published, we email people and say, look, like your voices are getting in, in, in local, um, which makes people feel empowered, or it is empowering, and people see that they can. One of the last things we did on this campaign was we we said, okay, like let's actually shape like what, what kind of decisions do we want to see made for our digital um, or at an international level? Like let's actually be proactive here and not just what we don't want, what we do want. And that is a hard thing to engage a mass of people in, unfortunately. It's easier to have people say like bad things stop than it is to be like, let's create a vision together. So this is requiring a, a much deeper level of engagement. But when you have people that getting engaged at this level, they'll stay with you for a long time. They'll donate more, they'll contribute more, they'll provide more value to, to your work and to your clubs. So through all of these things, we had, I think, like 300,000 people get involved in the campaign. We turned that crowdsource input and campaign input into a crowdsource um, report. And then what we did after that was we went and met with decision makers and said, here's what we want. And again, he took a picture, sent it to decision make, or sent it to our support to show their voice matters, recognize their up. So here is like a, a different kind of shot of that of that pyramid of engagement. So I don't have to forget what year it is. We're planning together now, but uh, September of that year, the engagement period looked like like that. Uh, people uh, at the lower level of engagement. Um, up, and then we could track over time and see, okay, we're getting a, a deeper, um, larger campaign engagement by um, at that similar level. Uh, um, so that's just showing the kind of full spectrum engagement and relationship building that happens over time. And that's powerful, um, and, and decision makers uh, notice that. Um, and, and through doing this kind of campaign, um, you can really kind of shape the debate um, and and show people the, the power that they actually have in doing things. And so this is a shot of Megan at at, um, at Open Media, um, and she's just about to go into um, uh, to do a presentation before a parliamentary committee. And um, and afterward, I said, "What was that like?" And she was like, "Well, it was amazing to have all these people behind me." And um, and you could tell that um, people in that meeting were really shaken up and really were taking her very seriously in what she was saying. It's because there's all these people, there's all this power of this deeply, this deep and wide community. So, TDP is dead. Um, Trump wants to take credit for it, but as this Guardian headline shows, it's actually, he just took advantage of a movement. Um, but we created a context where the TPP could be really important. We, in this, when I say we, I mean a collective, um, huge number of organizations, a huge number of people. 
So I'm going to go into another case study, um, Build CPT1. Um, how many people have heard of this? So, okay, almost everyone. Um, it's good. Um, uh, surveillance bill um, that Harper put forward that is sadly still kind of in place. Um, uh, there's privacy issues, there's issues with civil liberties, um, a number of issues. So this is just an another kind of example of that pyramid of engagement, um, very similar to CPT. Um, and you can see again how we did it, very similar. Low barrier petition, um, email your MP, letters to the editor, tweet your representative. Uh, this is uh, lead now um, using a um, click to call tool. And again, this is kind of the power of networks. Like at the time, we couldn't bring this to bear, but uh, lead now is one of our network partners. So they um, made this tool available um, as part of the campaign. So the results are 300,000 efficient signatures, 50 published letters, um, thousands of tweets, um, many donations. Uh, I like to think that we contributed to our first um, And this is um, just in, term, in terms of um, recognition and showing impact. Um, after the liberals got elected, um, they, they were happy to to meet with us. And I think they thought that we would just be kind of polite. I mean, we were like we were play with them, but we also shoved that giant petition in their face, took a picture, and tweeted it out. You know, he, he doesn't, he looks concerned. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's still a ways to go, but um, we're, we're making serious and really important reforms on C51. Um, and having talked to the, the minister um, and others in government PMO as well, um, all of them have said it's because they're concerned with the fact that we have this deeply engaged community. Um, that will be activated in that we're not voting for the next time uh, that we speak in on social media. Um, that's the reason that and the network of partners we have doing great policy work, doing great things. Um, so it's that powerful community of organizations and people that makes it. So I don't think I'll show these, but basically like, my goal is to share this model with other organizations, including the tools um, uh, and the strategies, uh, and, and to basically empower other organizations to do this work. That it, it can really make change. I think it can help people, uh, it can help build trust again in our society and our city. Um, and that's really what I want to do now. And I think it can work. This isn't just an open media thing, it's something that can work for other organizations. And it doesn't have to be. I, I know like it can be a bit daunting, but it's kind of you can start small and work up to, to kind of these more robust campaigns. So in open media in the earlier days, um, we would just do uh, we would do petitions and then we would do email your your member of parliament. Those two things, and that was like we were still getting people really engaged and we were growing our community over time. And then we just started adding more over time. So it's not a kind of all or nothing, it's just how do you how do you take some of these principles and the tools that you do have and use them to get a bigger community behind you um, in a more deeply engaged way? Uh, and so this is um, the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, they use some of these tools and practices um, around, around the election and before the election, and they got all the, all the parties to put a commitment to act, moving on mental health issues um, in their platforms in the BC election. Um, this is the Watershed Watch. They recently won, um, uh, there was going to be cuts to um, salmon research, um, and they recently stopped that. Um, trying to that happen. Um, Breastfeeding University used some of these tools and strategies recently um, to close the, the gender wage gap there. Uh, the SBCA re recently won this uh, pet sales ban. I don't want to get all political on you, but um, 
but this is um, from the, the Green Party and NDP agreement um, after, or announcement after they said they were going to do a cooperative government agreement. This, to everyone who has emailed, tweeted, called, messaged, or signed in the last few weeks uh, to tell us what kind of government they want to see, please note we encourage you. This deal is happening. And there were tens of thousands of people, a bunch of organizations that were using the types of methods and strategies we were talking about, ten dollars a day campaign. Um, there's a huge list. And so this stuff works. And um, I I think also like the reason why I, I care about this and I'm showing this because I think that these these tools can be fun, and we can we can reimagine kind of how our democracy looks when we build it um, through these kinds of agreements. Especially if we have more adoption of this kind of thing, I think we just really need that right now. There's a huge opportunity in this province, in the province, um, but at a national and global scale, I think that personally, I'm just concerned with the way. Society is going, and I think that we need to scale up our strategies uh, to meet that crisis. And, and that, that means being as effective as we can possibly be. So that's why every day I um, share this um, help organization and tools. And so um, if you want to talk about that after to chat with you, because that's basically what I want to do with my life, um, what, it, what, what I am doing with my life. Um, and um, yeah, happy to. Answer any questions, and I think we should go to Q and A. I have no idea why I have this. I just like it. Yeah. Um, so, so Eli, can we go to Q and A? Let's do it. Um, awesome, Steve. I'll let you do the pointing and the selecting. Um, and if you could basically just repeat back the question so everyone else can hear it afterwards, uh, which means you all need to give it short, pithy, question questions, not rambly, statement questions. That way you can easily repeat them. Thank you. I'll, I'll go with a ramble. <laughs> um, so you, you cited a lot of examples of for Feedback for more detail. Right. Okay. So, tell me if I'm getting this right. So the question is, how do we, how do you get more detailed and in-depth um, input into a government process, process, rather than just you know, the simple like, petition and stuff? Is that right? Yeah. So. I think it's it to me it's the same kind of process I described. So I think you still want to start with something simple uh, to get people kind of in the door. To like, like it, it depends on like where your community is heading to. Like if you have a community of a thousand people and like they've written submissions to government processes before, or they've written like then like and that's the kind of input you want. Then go back to the people, ask them to do that. Um, through, um, um, you can create forms that are just open to if they want, or, or you can have a more detailed letter that you can send to them and they'll follow up. Um, so I think that's one way to do it. If, if you don't have a, a like deeply engaged community already, um, then I think it's find something that will kind of walk them to that process. Um, so try to think ahead um, and just start with something very simple, like, hey, are you concerned with the policy issue? Um, and then they put their hand up by signing up on one, and then go back to those people online. Because I think the thing is, if you go to someone who's never engaged with this project, here, write a 10 page essay on this issue. Um, you, you just want like, many people to do that. It's just a huge leap. It's like ask, you, uh, me asking you to drive. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Some people will do it, but you're aware of tech. Uh, discussion. The tagline, very 
It's easy to solve one. Yeah. Yeah. So Howie's from uh, Stand Out. <laughs> They're working on this every day. Um, um, also, it's really inspired. I know a bunch of you are musicians, and it's really a bit intimidating and inspiring to everyone who's here right now. Um, so, how would I do that? I mean, I would. So, I think I would look for where I can I can um, reach a bigger community of people in, in creative ways. So I would try and map that a bit. So for example, like thinking of creatively about that, like, hey, like there's companies like Bulldog Power and other companies who have environmental surveys. And I would try and reach out to them and say, hey, would you join a large campaign about whatever we think is the best policy thing. I'm not an expert on that. Let's say it's like a um, I would say, would you join that campaign? And then I would set up some kind of a, uh, a day of action or a week of action that had a clear kind of reflection point and a clear delivery projection of what we're saying. Um, and then I would get those people to send a message to all of their customers on that particular day to grow a huge movement, and then I would push those people to share on social media, climb, I would climb them up the throw deep in the community and have other actions. But I think I would do, I think you have to start with how do you reach a community and then how do you engage them? I didn't touch too much on the first question, um, which is a really important one. Um, I touched a lot on the second question, which is like how do you reach them? But I would do, I would do that so, you know, um, Tomorrow is this day of action on net neutrality. It's on, on my mind because I'm really excited about it. And one reason I think they will win, because we've seen this before, is you have Amazon, Netflix, Google, others who are going to put up and telling people to take action. So that's going to be millions of people. And that is just super powerful. And then you're going to have organizations like Open Source and Open Future to make progress who are going to use this type of model to keep those people engaged, keep them calling, tweeting. Um, engaging with, part, uh, with Congress until they until they back down. So when I look at the environment, you know, what's their Netflix? What's their like? Who has a big audience to tap into? And so open media, um, an example here, uh, similar is that when we wanted to fight those meter billing prices, we went out to independent ISPs like TechStat, and we said, "Hey, this is going to be bad for you as well. Will you email your 200, 300,000?" about it and it took a lot more discussion but eventually they're like yeah okay and so that's one reason why our community is so big and why we want to do this um, so that's does that answer your question okay yeah i think i want to follow up on that one that was said the space is wrecking the problems for mountains <laughs> and i just want and i i i, 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 I that started trying to get massive campaigns to try to try to was never a <laughs> is that really the question? Yeah. Well, on the other side of the brink. Um, Down the valley. Okay. Uh, uh, summarize that one. Yeah. Well, I think the question is, uh, how do you um, turn a conservative into an MEP or to turn someone who has, uh, um, who is supporting something that you? Don't believe in maybe that's Trump or something like that. Um, into someone who is aligned with your values and in supporting change in that direction. Um, if I had that answer, <laughs> um, or if I had a really good answer to that, I, I would be out doing it, or I would spend more of my time doing it or not sleep or something. But I think um, I think what I could what I could say to that is um, I think there are. Um, 
common values that all people have. I think that's fairness, uh, human nature. Um, and I think that there are there are issues that speak to that that can connect with people who might be supporting um, something that's not in their interest. Um, and I actually think like the net neutrality example is a good one. Um, it's just basically standing up for free expression online, and that's something that, regardless of your political views, you can believe in. There's lots of people, conservative, um, libertarian, um, who share that value. Uh, and so you can connect with people there and then start a relationship and kind of move forward over time. And I think one thing about open media is that, like, you know, in a way that's, that's partially, I think, what we've done with, with issues around with lots of people who are um, far right wing, uh, uh, share different values across the political spectrum. We worked with the National Fire Association on privacy issues. Um, but we just found common values and then moved forward from there. And I think that's important for, for like changing politics and in progressive direction if that's, if that's what you're after. But I also think it's important um, for us to not be so um, polarized, for us to rebuild our trust in each other, which I think is, um, I think that it's really dangerous when we have on mass people don't trust each other, they don't believe in each other. I think that is just a problem through our campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the question, if I can summarize it, um, how do you um, build an engaged community and make change um, with a group of people who might not be comfortable being public with the issue or the concerns? So, yeah. Um, and the example is old AD, we want to make change. Um, and so I think the first question is find where the where the people are that um, are out there. So are there other groups that are already working on this that could um, connect you in? Is there um, resource departments that are working on this? Um, like find whatever community that already exists. Like open well, media at the really early days, like we were like going to faculty associations and being like, can you email your like list of students who are doing communication stuff? Because that's where we could find people um, that we could reach. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is um, use tools through New Motor or elsewhere that are, you could configure them so that they're less kind of public facing. It definitely makes it more challenging um, overall. Like, um, but, but you can make it so that um, when you're sending messages to members of parliament um, or other decision makers, um, it's not publicly identifying you, it's just saying, I'm a local constituent of this person uh, who's concerned about this. So there's ways that you could kind of craft the engagement so that it fits to that um, particular group. Any other questions? Yeah, um, open media is definitely myself personally. Yeah, 
definitely have more expertise in the online. We just real master that one. <laughs> um, other organizations like Organizing for Change, Dogwood, Stand, others um, are, are stronger in, in offline engagement, but I think there are some general principles. Um, the more you climb people up the pyramid of engagement, the more likely you can move them along. Um, and so that's something that a lot of the groups I just mentioned in general, they're trying to, they're usually trying to um, climb you up the pyramid and then when they get a certain point, be like, hey, now join a form or hey, now come and do canvassing. So I think it's as far up as you can go, but you know, if you're in a campaign moment, you're probably just going to email everyone from those canvassing. Um, but if you can climb people up and have people who are a bigger community up top, um, it's much easier to convert them to off stuff, which I think is like, can be the most powerful form of engagement. Super. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Can you say that again? Yeah. Um, so the question was, um, um, the question was, um, before you have a community or a mailing list, um, like how to build media and, and what advice can I give, um, kind of growing your email list to start. Um, um, and there, there's a, there's a bunch of different, different ways. I mean, if you have a budget, um, you can go to an organization called Care2. They basically will run a petition on your issue and invite people to offer to join you. And then you can then engage them. Um, so that's one idea. Um, another idea is um, have a really low barrier action and use um, Facebook ads. If you, again, if you have a budget. Um, if you don't have a budget, um, or if you do but want to be more creative, I would just think like first principles of like where is an accessible community of people who like you. Um, and so, like I was saying, you know, if you're environmentalist, maybe that's called drug power. Um, uh, so, um, so at Open Media, we were, we, like I said, we were kind of going to like academic and being like, hey, we know you care about email your students. So like wherever people are, um, and it's, it's hard to generalize, um, but I would just go through a process of thinking about that and asking like, like Open Media really joined as kind of a network of organizations. And we just had calls where we were like, how do we reach people? Like we just asked ourselves the questions, and some people were like, I'm an academic, I don't reach people. I have this mailing list. Other people were like, oh, I actually like, have like this big like, mailing list I started with, and I think 500 people on that email and them. And then uh, we had the Council of Canadians, who was an early Canadian, really generous with helping us with outreach and social media. Or, or just, sorry, there actually wasn't even Canadians, but, um, but just helping us with outreach and otherwise mailing stuff. Um, dating myself. Um, so I think you just have to ask the question people because already and then think about where you can go. Any other questions? I was going to say for the policy long question or intervention. That's a good one. The crowdsourcing tool? The, the uh, save our stuff. Uh, yeah, well, the crowdsourcing tool for the consultation. Um, so, NASDAQ works for Open Media and uh, <laughs> has been very involved in some of our recent campaigns. And so, um, NASDAQ was asking if I could speak to some of the ways that Open Media has tried to engage people. In a, in a deeper way, on more detailed policy, speaking a little bit more about the, the newer stuff that um, the Open Media has, has done, and um, I think that's a good, good point. Um, so, one thing that Open Media did to kind of engage people in the policy element was we had a tool where you could, you had 
policy talking points um, listed beside the tool, and they were detailed and sophisticated. Um, we, made, we made them as accessible as we could, but they were real policy talking points, um, you know, talking about pointing to legal language. Um, and this was part of the C51 uh, government consultation. So we wanted to empower our community to send specific policy points into this government. That was kind of the goal. Um, and so the, we made it so those talking points, you could just click on them and it would enter the policy point into this tool. And so you could just choose and then you could edit from there. So it made it, it kind of just made it feel and just legitimately be easier to put in some talking points um, into a government consultation. So it wasn't requiring you to just either like look at a big letter and agree with it, edit or write in policy points. It was kind of getting you point by point in accessible to policy points. Um, the ability um, the other thing that Open Media um, recently did to kind of engage people deeper in, in policy points, um, we didn't we didn't trust that the government was going to actually listen to people um, in their C fifty one consultation, even though they said that was, Goodell was like definitely going to listen to you, um, and so so initially what what we we did was um, we had a campaign to push them to make the results of the consultation public because governments and the NEB and environmental sector is um, <laughs> kind of known for this. They'll kind of be like, hey, we'll listen to your input. It goes to a black box and they're like, everyone said everything's fine. Don't <laughs> um, And so we, we, we've seen that many before. So, so we ran a campaign demanding that they make the consultation input public. And then eventually they buckled on that, so that was a win. And they made the results available to us. And so we had an agenda there. And our agenda was we took those tools, those comments, we put them in this crowdsourcing tool, um, and we invited our supporters to rate each comment. So we had people rate thousands and thousands, 50,000 comments. Um, people across the country say, like, and we just asked them a few questions, like, does this comment say repeal? C51, does it say add new oversight measures, um, et cetera? Um, and so we actually had them crowdsource people who are at that level where they actually want to read a citizen submission on a policy thing and rate it for us. Um, we gave them that avenue to engage at that level. Um, and then afterwards, what we found was most people want to repeal C51. So we announced that and said, okay, all you have to do is do the right thing. Um, so it just frames the debates and, and, and shapes. The debate and, and just lets people get engaged at a deeper policy level because there are people like in open media's community who are definitely right there and they want to submit detailed policy. And if we just ask them to sign a petition, that's almost insulting. So we want to meet them where they're at in that way. Um, so, yeah, thanks for trying that. Did I, did I capture it? Yeah, and you could also assess of that one. We ran out of comments. Yeah, what Nasdaq said is we, yeah, we actually, we we're like, we'll just throw like a batch of, I don't know what, 10,000 or something, and like, it'll be enough that we can like make a statement about people probably won't like, or I think we were like, we don't know how many people are like this. It's a big ask to do, like to reach the thing, rate it, stand behind it. Um, and what we found was like, yeah, within a couple hours, that we ran into those comments, we're like, ah, and then they just keep drawing them in, and basically they rated all, every single. Um, so there was a, it was surprising to me um, that um, people have that thirst. So there is like this hunger for people that have real authentic deep interest. And so you just have to provide that avenue to them. I don't think like every person, um, someone who's just hearing about C51 might not jump through that group yet, but there's definitely a, a community and a, and a hunger. For it. And I think that is not just for the media, I think that's any issue that, that affects people's daily lives. Like people, if you give them an avenue, have their voice feel is real, it is real, um, people will, will take that. There's this kind of myth that um, that people, millennials and people in general are disengaged. Um, but actually, if you look at the research, they're more engaged locally, they're more engaged in these types of campaigns, and it's because they're not engaged in traditional politics as much, it's because they don't think their voice is going to be heard in a real way. Um, so, but when you give them an avenue that's real and, and 
show with that roadmap, but I think that's the last one. What, what NASA? Any more questions or comments? That's the burn you're talking about? What are you talking about? Carbon, yeah. <coughs> yeah, so the comment was just <laughs> Jeremy Corbin um, got 74% of millennials to in support of um, because he actually invited them to participate in our Example, there's this latent desire to participate. So I think we'll cut it off there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the conversation will go on because, as I said, booze afterwards. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Cheers.